Hi, everybody. With our Legend Life Stories, we look to share the stories of inspirational people who are out there and living their best life after 40. So we speak to adventurers, explorers, athletes, and outdoors people who are out there proving to us all that age does not define us. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Mark Wood. Mark is a, a Arctic explorer, expedition leader who has conducted or completed over 30 expeditions, including two solo unsupported expeditions to the geographic North and South Poles. He's biked across the US, he's biked across Oman, he's biked the length of New Zealand, he's walked across Iceland and a myriad of other adventures and expeditions. He is also the author of the book Solar Explorer and the photo book Rock and Ice. He is also a professional speaker and also film producer. He gets involved in documentaries with BBC and other leading uh, media organisations. So, Mark, how are you going today? I'm good. You missed something off there, by the way. I did? I'm also, fi I'm also 55 and I've got a cup of tea. So, um, <laughs> is that okay? Yeah, it's not it's... all rock and roll, you know. <laughs> <laughs> perfectly fine, perfectly fine. So, you need your cup of tea after reading off all of those accolades. So, <laughs> so Mark, so tell us a little bit about your background. So growing up, were you always into the outdoors, you know, being adventurous? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure really. I used to play a lot of football at school and I was like the fitness side to, to what I did. I was more hands-on than sort of, you know, using my brain uh, in a classroom. I was better at hands-on. Um, but then um, I joined the military when I left school um, and I think that was a, a big sort of inspiration for me because it was a period of time when you're go either going to further education or university or apprenticeships and that and I actually spent the time between 17 and 21 um, in the military so and I think that gave me a di different perspective on what was at outside of my country and and how life could be slightly different um, and I think from there whatever I did after that it was always with an eye, one eye on the outdoors um, as a bit of an inspiration so awesome so so what inspired you to join the military like as you said you took a different direction than a lot of other people take so what was it about the military that kind of appealed to you I, I've tried to be be honest in my thoughts about this because um it's you never it's difficult to remember why you choose certain things that you do the only things that i c come to mind is that you know i didn't do great at school i'm not proud of that i'm not one of these guys who goes into gives talks in schools and go i didn't do well at school but look at me now that's that's no message <laughs> you know but i wasn't i wasn't really great at exams i think that's a better way of putting it um, I was good at school, but not great exams. So when I left school, I didn't really have anything to sort of springboard me into anything else. Um, and I think I saw some posters of, you know, soldiers and working abroad, playing volleyball and living this life. So the posters actually worked on me. And before I knew, you know, I went in the office to swear in. And, um, and before I knew it, I was in uniform with my head shaved. Um, so, um, I, and I think I did well to begin with because I was quite fit and they like that side of, um, you, if you really were fit and tried, they, they, the military kind of liked that. So. Awesome. So, so, so now you leave the military. So you mentioned, I think it was like age 21 and then how did this kind of like journey to becoming an explorer kind of like get started? I mean, cause you know, it's kind of like an unusual path, isn't it? You don't wake up one day and go, I'm going to be an explorer. So, so how did you get there? Um, yeah, there's no explorer university or anything like that you can go to. Um, I think I was just reading books as people do on adventure. And I quite like um, autobiographies and true stories and that. And so I think in the back of my mind, there was always like this adventure 
aspect going on. Um, but I, I then, I did a lot of traveling when I left the military, went back to places that I'd worked with in, work in, in the military, but without a gun. So I just went back with a rucksack and explored. Um, I joined a fire and rescue service in the UK and spent 10 years in there. Um, and then midway through the fire and rescue service, I, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to, it's, we all have a choice nowadays. And I think your podcast is, is great at this because you get to whatever, whatever age you are now, you can go out and have an adventure. So that's the stage I was at at the age of 35. So quite old, really. I was thinking, well, what else can I do apart from the fire and rescue service? I want to keep my job, but I want to go and do something very different. So I was looking at things like the marathon, the Saab and, um, things like that and then somebody just said oh there's a somebody put in a polar expedition together um, and I'd read books on you know expeditions and that and I kind of liked the idea of the, the physical and mental side of a polar expedition and and I, but I didn't know anything else it was just almost like a romantic look of exploration through the eyes of Shackleton and Scott and you know does that make sense and yeah and then, and just sort of having that feeling, well, I'd love to see what that's like. And, um, and I think, uh, well, I, I then went on a, a selection and, and got through, I went out and was trained in the high Arctic Canada. Um, I, then the next year I was led on an expedition. Then I started training people. Then I started lead, leading teams. So over the first five or six years, I was almost learning my trade while still in the fire and rescue service. So I was taking three months off a year to no pay, no pension, um, just to de- just to go out and enjoy this new thing that I'd found. Um, and I think at the beginning of my exploration, polar exploration career, which is 20 years now, um, it was based on ego, uh, but in a good way. It was kind of like, I want to go out and see what this is like. There was no reason for going out there apart from the fact that I wanted to improve myself, uh, improve what I was seeing and doing, you know. Um, so that was the ego side, but it, it very much changed. And I'm sure we'll touch on that. Awesome. So what was, so beyond that first kind of like trip, you know, then you went off and, done, and did a number of solo kind of like uh, polo kind of trips. So what inspired you to make the decision, I'm going to go off and do one of these by myself? Well, it, it, it's good because leading on from what I said about the egotistical side of it, which was a, a measured ego, um, I got to a certain point and I was, I think I was six or seven years in and I'd led, started leading some major expeditions um, and still learning, and still learning now, by the way. It's not that I'm, I was trying to find out, you know, how to be the best that I can. I'm still learning. But I got to a point where I could lead, leave the fire and rescue service and dedicate my whole time to this. Uh, or I could stay where I was and, and really just not do any polar exploration. Um, and I decided to leave. I literally, literally stepped into the unknown, left the pension behind, left my everything behind. I had nothing. And I just focused on how I wanted, what I wanted to do next. Now in business or anything in life, when you step it up a little bit, so to speak, um, you need to do something which will improve you or give you a little bit of a boost. So in a company, you might go from, you know, 10 employees to 100 employees or, you know, whatever it, the scenario might be. Uh, for me, it was about doing something which would stretch me and would get a media interest. And the media interest was because I started to develop education programs and I wanted to push this out. So I thought, well, what, what could I do? Well, I'd never done solo before. I read a book by Penn Haddo, which I've got up here, uh, called Solo. Um, and that kind of inspired me to think, well, oh, that is a different level to an expedition. When you, it's all right cycling solo or, you know, walking up a mountain in the UK or wherever you are solo, but to actually stretch yourself out across a white desert, cold white desert is a very, different thing and so I decided to do the South Pole solo and then once completed that I would then go up and try and do the North Pole solo 
Um, and I'm unknown. I'm still unknown. And for three years of preparing this, I was ridiculed and by mainly people within the industry saying, who the hell is this guy? Who, who does he think he can do this, you know? Um, but I kind of believed in what I was doing and I understood my own skill sets. And most importantly, I kind of understood the terrain I was getting into, the pitfalls that might happen. So I went into it with my eyes open in a realistic sense, which, which was half the battle. Um, and I prepared well and then um, eventually I got the money together and, and, and skipping right forward, I was dropped off on the west coast of Antarctica. The plane disappeared and bang, I, I, was, I was alone, I was isolated and the journey began. So, so how long did it take you to reach where, what was it again? So like the geographic South Pole? Yeah, it took me 50 days. Um, a funny thing happened, I don't usually say this, but I think it might appeal to a lot of people this. Um, so Randolph Fines is a you know good, good explorer in the UK and that, very much sort of old schoolish, um, which makes him quite quirky and, and interesting and et cetera. And he's done some remarkable expeditions. And I read in his book, Living Dangerously, um, a little quote that he had at the start of his South Pole expedition with Mike Stroud. And he he was standing in the very same position I was then stood, you know, 20 years later. But his his words, as he looked, as the plane disappeared and he looked out to, towards the South Pole, he said in his book, a thousand jumbled thoughts helped to oust the appalling, appalling realisation that this was my first a uh, step of several thousand, my first breath of several million. And I thought that was wonderful. And he actually wrote that quote down and sent it to me in that. Now, when I was dropped off on the West Coast of Antarctica and the plane disappeared and I looked up, I went, oh, shit, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is not the greatest quote in the world. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not really known for great quotes, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I had basically I had seven hundred miles, uh, no, uh, statute miles, so six hundred and fifteen nautical to do. Um, if you do about fifteen a day, then you're looking at a forty day expedition. Um, so I, I was a little bit slow to begin with, um, which is which is what happens on long range expeditions, um, because you're trying to get going. You've got heavy sledges your body's in condition to the cold, you, you haven't covered any distance, um, your food's not working properly yet because it's quite high in calories. So you feel a little bit sick sometimes with the food. And uh, the analogy that I give to companies and schools is that everything's tough at the beginning, but you just persevere and push through and it all works itself out. I'm not, I'm not here today on your podcast to, to start being inspirational in that sense, but it does have a lot of parallels. To, uh, with with expiration so in the first week or so it was pretty tough for me i lost my ipod as well um and when you stare at a 360 of nothing uh, every single day and then you get a white out every third day and and basically you're not looking at mountains and you you can't see any people or animals or birds you've just got a white void in front of you you do need a slight mental stimulation every now and again and I'd lost that privilege. Um, and I don't take books or photographs with me. So I had nothing. Um, and that really kind of, and because it, Solo was new to me, it was kind of tough. It's like being locked in a prison cell and you think, how am I going to get through this? So I started to think how I could move on for the next 45 days. And I cr created things. Well, the biggest thing you can do in that situation is create a routine which helps your body and your mind develop a pattern and a time. Um, but still, I needed that stimulation. And I came to a point one day where I, I counted my ski steps, 3,000. I was ca literally counting. So I put my ski skis in the ground. I closed my eyes. And I thought, where do I, I can't do this, but where do I want to be on this planet at the moment? And I've got two lovely dogs. And um, I started to put my mind into the forest where I walk them back at home. And I started to walk my dogs and throw sticks and, 
and um, we moved onto the beach and I could smell the sea air. Um, and, and I spent three hours walking my dogs through this beautiful area of green forest and be beautiful blue ocean. And when I came out of that dreamscape, I was still in Antarctica, but I'd covered about 6.5 nautical miles. And that's kind of how I overcome some of the hard bits of the, the journey by just dreamscaping my way through the, through the journey itself. Incredible. So what other things did you learn about like keeping yourself motivated? Because like 50 days, as you said, pretty harsh environment, no one else around. You don't have anyone to kind of like, uh, you know, support you. So how do you keep yourself motivated over this period of time? Um, well, as I say, routine is a big thing. You've got to snap into a routine because um, that gives you a reason to get up in the morning, a structure for movement, a uh, structure for time and distance that you're doing and, and navigation, etc. cetera. Um, and then, as I say, the dreamscapes are there. That's a, that's a good thing for pushing forward. Any time that I felt weakness, um, I had a mantra in me that would say, nobody told you to do this. You know, you put yourself here, so you've got yourself to blame. I'm quite good at creative thinking as well. Um, uh, I was walking with a friend the other day and he said to me, you've never been on a solo expedition. There's always been people with you <laughs> pointing yeah. at my head, you know, and some of us have that great creativity that um, allows us to sort of be different from others, you know, just through our, our way of thinking I suppose comedians do it a lot. They look at a, a normal situation and see the comedy in, in a normal situation. And, and writers will do it. And, you know, great creative magazine writers and whatever will do it. And I, I kind of do it myself. I have this lovely way of looking at life. Um, so I, I, I had that with me. Um, the other things was, you know, I worked with a psychologist before I left from Warwick University um professor harbinder sandhu and we were trying and she actually published a paper out of my my two journeys uh which went into the polar journal so you might be able to look back on that but um basically i don't write a diary or anything um because i'm a bloke if it's a shit day i write it's a shit day <laughs> you know there's no there's no greatness in there there's no words with I'm, i actually live near shakespeare uh, Stratford on Avon uh, in Warwickshire, but I'm not like the Bard. So, um, <laughs> so, so I use a dictaphone, which I'm sure he didn't. Um, and I I sew it into my um, sleeping bag, and at night time I'd sort of get the dictaphone and speak into it, and I'd really be open. I've never listened to it. This is like 10, 12 years ago now. I've never listened to it. My mum died 10 years before other stuff has happened in my life. And I think I just poured out, at the end of the day, I just poured out into this dictaphone. It got transcribed. Uh, they, wrote a, they, they wrote a paper out of um, Psychology of Solo Exploration. Um, and the reason for telling you this, what is the reason for telling you this? Oh, yeah, before we left, because I'd never done a solo and she'd never worked with an explorer before, nothing really came up. We, we never really came up with anything cool to help me through this, apart from one thing. She said, what would potentially go wrong on the expedition? And, of course, I did the North Pole as well. So polar bear attacks, open water, strong winds, uh, isolation, mental breakdown, kit breakdown, um, all these things. You know, you can list them. There's probably about 10 things that potentially stop an expedition. And she said to me, understand that these things are going to happen. So when it does happen, you leave all the emotion out of it and you just deal with the situation. And that was quite cool because when I was in the fire and rescue service and the military and any guys who have been in these who are listening, listening to this, you're very well trained. You've got the right equipment. You, you work alongside incredible people and you deal with major incidents like um, maybe battlefield stuff or or car accidents or whatever, but you deal with it without emotion. So you're just very effective in the moment through your training and your team approach. And then afterwards, that's when the emotion kicks in. 
uh, and the PTSD that we all know about now, the mental health side of it kicks in. Um, so even when I was out there for 50 days, I was still in a mode, a professional mode of what can happen, deal with it like you would, you know, as you've done in your past. Very good. So were there any moments where you did have some of these issues come up? Yeah, I mean, very different moments from the north to the south. So the South Pole, it was more about looking after myself and my kit each each and every day. The only outside problems you have to deal with on the Antarctic ice are crevasses, but you know where they are because they kind of tell you so you can navigate around them. Um, strong winds coming, catabatic winds coming off the um, the glaciers. Um, but, you know, that's just strong winds. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, and then you head into altitude. So 3,000 metres is the the ending plateau towards the South Pole. So you're actually heading into lack of oxygen. Um, so, you know, that that's what I faced there. But then the North was very different because, you know, I had, I had, you know, open water and thin ice. So where I pitched my tent at night was a major issue. Um, the shifting of the ice, the ice each day was horrendous. It was a, uh, a movement you're, work, you're walking on ice which is literally moving around you um and then of course you've got the polar bear effect around you as well the you have to be it's like being on patrol you know in the military you've got this added added fear of the enemy um those polar bears are kind of low down on the list of dangers which might sound strange but it's they are still a factor you know um to what you're doing very good. And then, so how did it feel to complete both these? Well, the first one, because that's your very first, so how did that feel for you? Well, um, my mind, I'm, it's really funny. Many years ago, when I got in the fire service, it's hard to get in the fire service. And when I got my letter through, my brother said to me, aren't you excited? I was like, well, I haven't done the training yet. <laughs> he said, you're never excited. You're never satisfied. Um and it's true. I'm always looking for the next thing. Um, and I never take the time to enjoy. So when I reached the South Pole, I was thinking about the North. In fact, you know, to give myself a bit of a, you know, to let myself off a little bit. Um, you know, I was only halfway through this mission statement of an expedition. I still had the North to do. Um, so I was focused on the, the, the North Pole. The North Pole section was scuppered at logistics in a way. Um, long story short i had to be helicoptered into an arbitrary point on the russian side of the arctic ocean and i did um a last two degrees expedition to the north so it it was a hard expedition um but not what i wanted but when i got to the north pole i did realize what i'd achieved and i i do say this a lot to to schools especially and businesses but you have people around you now who go well done and they pat you on the back and say that's great what you've done but do you actually recognize your own achievements you you don't have to do it out of like i'm the greatest that's not the point of that it's like if you put hard work into something and you've gone out your way and stepped out of your life to actually try and achieve something whether it's built you know it might be that you've you've built a family do you know? And, the, and you've, you've raised your kids well, or it might be that you've worked hard at work or, or whatever it might be. But when I stood at the North Pole, um, I had 7.2 billion people below me. And I was the only person on planet Earth stood at the North Pole at that point. And I felt extremely humble. Um, and I recognized that achievement at that point. Um, yeah. Uh, However, I need to step back a little bit. Is that okay? Because I've missed something sure. quite vital out. On the final day of approaching the North Pole, you're walking across a vast area of ice stretching from Russia all the way to Canada, to Barrow in Alaska, all the way to Svalbard, Spitsberg, and places like that. It's vast ice of isolation, hostile environment. And when you reach the point of the geographic North Pole, 
you expect to get this kind of cold moon visual effect. When I reached the geographic North Pole, there was a wedding going on. <laughs> so as I approached the point on my GPS of, of um, uh, 59, what is it? What is it? 50, um, no, 89, 59, 59, the point of the North Pole. There was a cross, there was a helicopter, there was a trestle table full of food and drinks. There was a guy getting married and there was a wedding party. And I basically gate crashed a guy called Bork Aslund's wedding, a great Norwegian, probably the best polar explorer on the planet. And um, they looked as surprised as me. And I think out of everything that I've done in my life, to gate crash a wedding at the North Pole was my my biggest and finest achievement. So <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So how long did it take you to do the North Pole expedition? It took about 20 days, that's all. So not too long. It was a broken expedition. I mean, it's worth saying why. Um, because it will lead on to my next expedition, which maybe we'll talk about that later. But there is a problem with the with exploration, polar exploration at the moment. And it is totally to do with the change of climate of our planet. Um, the Arctic Ocean, uh, over many, many years has been explored and people are going out sort of trying to find the, what's at the North Pole, the days of Peary and Scott. And, well, Scott and Shackleton focused on the South, but, you know, you have Franklin's expeditions and the, the British Empire heading, sending out all these great ships to find out the Northwest Passage and what was going on around the Arctic Ocean. You then had a great expedition in 69 by Sir Wally Herbert, who crossed from Barrow in Alaska all the way to to Svalbard through the North Pole and other expeditions as well that, that cross this great ice. Since I think, and I, the, don't really quote me on the, the years, but I think it's 2014, um, the last, or 2012, the last expedition coastal to the North Pole happened. After that, nobody's done anything from the coast. And the reason for that is that the planes that supply the rescue and the drop-offs from the Canadian side um, are reluctant to send their pilots onto the ice to do any rescues or extractions or whatever it might be. We have a real responsibility in this modern era to look at that as a, a priority with your expeditions. In the days of Scott and Shackleton, they jumped on ships, they headed down to Antarctica, they did whatever they did, and if they made mistakes, which they did, then they had to sort it out themselves. But nowadays we do have responsibility to that pilot who has a family, kids at home. And because you're some kind of explorer, professional camper, whatever you want to label yourself, the ego that you have doesn't match the life that he, he, he de deserves. So you need to factor that in. Um, and it's a long way of saying that they wouldn't operate on the Canadian side for me to drop me off and pick me up. So I had to really change plans. And that's because the ice is not stable because of this, the impacts of like global warming. So there's no safe way for them to kind of land. It's always kind of like risky. Yeah, sorry, I, I did miss that factor. So yeah, it is It is to do with that. The ice has, has melted so much that it's unpredictable of how to land. Um, look, if I rocked up on the Arctic Ocean, and just set off, I would probably make it to the North Pole or I'd, I'd be in a good chance because you'd hop between the ice, you'd find a way across, you'd persist with whatever's in front of you. And if you're strong willed and bodied, then you can make it. But you still have to, but you can't do that. That's my point. You, it, would, you, I would, it would be disgraceful to do it because you, there is a chance that you might go, something go wrong, a massive chance. And then that pilot can't land his plane or risk his own life to land a plane. So, um, you know, the, the ice is devastated up there and it's, um, it's super un unpredictable nowadays. So, yeah. Understood. So what is it about the polar regions that kind of like attracts you? Because it seems like everything you do, apart from the 
biking kind of like uh, trips is kind of like more cold weather kind of like orientation so what is the attraction well i also do mountain expeditions as well but i only started them off because it the polar polar season is is short the mountain season is short as well so you know, they'll finish the polar one and have a bit of rest and go into the mountains somewhere else in the world. So that's how I occupied my sort of time. And um, But the, pol the polar regions, when I first, when I did my first expedition and I headed out to the high Arctic Canada, it was minus 35 in Ottawa, in Ottawa, the capital. And then we flew a further six or seven hours north, reached Resolute Bay along the Northwest Passage, and it was minus 40, 45, strong winds. As I got off the plane and walked to the terminal, the cold air went into my, my throat and hit my lungs and I was coughing all the way to the terminal. And I was in fear, I was frightened, I was scared. Um, and over that 70 days, I kind of learned to, you know, I learned my first steps of how to pitch a tent, how to survive, how to live and move. But I think the key thing that I learned on that first expedition and subsequently every expedition after that was how to appreciate uh, the region that I was working in, meaning the solitude, the purity, the, um, the, is the isolation of it all, how in real life, i.e. where we live, in cities and towns, whatever, Every day there's noise and distraction and bills and news. And I mean, it's horrible putting the telly on at the moment with the news that we're hearing around the world. But then you go up and you basically escape into this white void. And yes, it's cold, but if you, if you can adapt and live with the cold and learn how to move, then it becomes this incredible retreat of your body and mind. It's, it's purification. Um, I've gone out there with uh, injuries and limps, <laughs> you know, especially as I've got older, it's kind of been like, you know, back hurts for whatever. But it's after a few days of just operating in the cold, your body just really does connect again. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a massive drug for me, really. So it's the mental and the physical challenge kind of like draws you because it's different than any other kind of environment. Yeah, I think to, to give you a good analogy for the everyday person is that, you know, I bought my dogs. I walked them this morning. I gave them a great walk last night. And it gives me, it allows me to think. Um, and I and they make me happy because they're enjoying pulling sticks out or whatever. And I think if you multiply that by thousand, that's what that's what extreme exploration gives to me. It just gives me a real sense of it gives me without being a hippie, it gives me a real connection of understanding the environment to my own existence. It's taught me that. So in the beginning, it wasn't about the environment for me. It was about what I could do that Rand Fines did. Um, but then it, I started to understand the environment when I worked in other areas around the world. So that became part of my DNA as well. But then it was, and it's what it gave to me over the years as a, as a person, you know, the physical side, the, the broadening of my, of my, my mind. Um, yeah. I think I'm, I think I'm waffling a bit there. No, it's, it's fine. No, no. What people need to understand what what kind of like draws you to these kind of things and what's possible because, as you said, most of us are caught up in big cities, lots of noise. We don't actually get time to kind of like uh, look at ourselves, and we're kind of like always distracted. We don't have any kind of like moments where, as you said, there's this purity and being away from everything else and being able to kind of like see how you relate to the environment around you and I guess nowhere in the world can give you what you kind of experience in the purity of kind of Antarctica but I think a lot of people do appreciate when they go on a hike and there's no one around 
and then you kind of like get to feel what it's like to be there not distracted not trying to prove anything not worried about what's going on you're just enjoying the moment and you get that at a very extreme level yeah i think so but i think if anybody's listening to this everybody's got a very different lives and and there's only a few that can go out and do long range polar expeditions or mountain expeditions there's probably a lot of people who go to work at nine come back at five they have a family they have a responsibility and they're listening to these podcasts because they have an interest in what other people do with their lives but escapism doesn't mean that you have to climb a mountain or disappear in a white void it can be that you just take your children down the bottom of your garden and have spend an hour enjoying their company and watching them you know it's about having that having that stress uh, release from the pressures of what you've done during the day. That's what it is. I've got a friend who's a good artist and I, I love art myself. I'm not very good at art, but I'm, I love art. I appreciate it. Um, and I think that's escapism. It's whatever you do outside of your normal life, which um, allows you to rack your, your mind. People go to the gym or they go for a run. Not everybody loves that either, really. It might be that you just want to sit with your loved one, you know, in the evening and, you know, watch the telly. That could be it. So I, I don't want to sit here talking to you and saying, this is it. This is what, this is how you do it. Because it's just one way that I do it, you know? Yeah. No, definitely. You got to find your personal way of relaxing and then, you know, chilling out. So let's talk about a few of your other kind of expeditions what have been your most memorable like apart from obviously gate crashing the wedding and uh you know <laughs> that's kind of be kind of like a moment like you're out of the void and you kind of like rock up and there's all these people having like a party almost on the ice so what other things have been memorable for you yeah i feel we've peaked too soon um <laughs> <laughs> No, which leads me on to Everest. That was a great segue, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so um, I think I mentioned before that I was looking at a section of the year thinking, actually, this, I'm not doing anything during this period. Um, and my mum passed away in 2003. Funnily enough, like the same time I changed my life, which I don't think was related, but, you know, it was just the way it is. And I went off to the Himalayas and, and went off on my own. I had one guide um, and we went to base camp of Mount Everest and I came back and I thought that was a, just a wonderful trek. And to cut a long story short, me and that one guide, who was a young lad at the time, we now run a business out there and we have done for 15 years. We've guided over 700 people to base camp, Annapurna circuit, 6,000 meter peaks um, and, and up to 8,000 meter peaks as well. So we've created this great guiding company based around my name Mark, uh, my company's name Markwood Explorer um, so we do that every year every October we, we just dedicate time out there to guiding these people but Everest was always looking at me and I've never I've never never in this world classed myself as a climber or a mountaineer or anything like that but Everest is a semi-technical mountain meaning that the lines are laid for you you're guided up there but it's still freaking hard to do because it's 8,000 meters plus 8,845, uh, 44 meters, 48 meters. Um, so it's high. It's like two miles above cloud level. Yeah. Um, so I looked at it and thought at that time, straight after when I did the, sorry, the South Pole and then the North Pole, I started to work with Skype uh, and Microsoft using these platforms that we're using today. Uh, but this was three years into the Skype development. So it was very early development for them. Uh, but now because of the pandemic, we were all kind of using them quite fluidly. Um, but then it wasn't the case. And I went into their offices in London and said, look, I've done the North and the South Pole, but I've got this great idea for Mount Everest. Uh, and again, sure, what we did working together we got 10,000 young people from around the planet in all different countries around the world um, to link into my expedition via Skype. We, I brought a dedicated team to set up the, the link via different satellites using uh, BGAN units to create this Wi-Fi space so I could get on a, 
on a tablet and link to schools live in Japan or or America, Australia, New Zealand as well, and other areas. But kids will be sitting in classrooms, linking to this guy and his team, his film crew as well, going from Kathmandu through the lower valleys, up through the higher valleys, the temples, going onto the glaciers, then up to base camp Everest, and then doing the approach to the summit of Mount Everest itself. So I think it's the first time that anybody actually engaged with so many young people as they join that crew to a, do an ascent of Mount Everest. Um, and the best example that I can give you on this is the death zone on Mount Everest, where a lot of people know just above 7,200 metres uh, at Camp uh, 3, you're moving into an area where the body is closing down. You only have limited time to operate before your body can't cope. So you move on to oxygen um, to help, but still you're having limited time. You've got 30% oxygen coming in your body naturally. Um, your brain starts to sway a little bit. And you see these climbers. Everybody's seen pictures or films of these climbers moving their way slowly up the mountain, fighting this internal battle of the next step. So that's when in the death zone, the 30% oxygen is coming into your body. So at that point, when these guys are climbing up the mountain slowly, I was actually sat on some ice um, and um, I was tied to some ice by a rope so I wouldn't slip off the mountain. And I was connected to a school in Australia where 200 young people were sat in a sports hall with a massive screen of an explorer climbing Everest live. And I delivered a lesson for 15 minutes from the death zone. And kids were coming up to the screen and asking me questions and they were interacting with me live. Now, nowadays, that's pretty impressive, but it's still, you know that you can do this. They do it on the space station, you know. But back then, it was unheard of. So this is quite really, this is how I changed my whole course of what I wanted to do as an explorer. I saw that what Shackleton done, did with, by bringing in a, a, a great photographer and taking pictures of his endurance uh, expedition, modern day exploration could use modern day technology to enhance what they were doing and bring it into classrooms and people's living rooms in real time. Um, so we embraced that. Um, but the only, well, to say the only issue, I think it was a good issue in the end, but I'd spent 72 days on the mountain doing the ascent. And on the final night from 8,000 meters um, to the summit, we set off and uh, about 200 meters away from the summit, the lead guide fell to his knees. There was four of us in the team. Um, the lead guides fell to his knees. The second guide was already abseiling back to, um, to camp four. The other guy in the team, he said to me, my feet are frozen. And I went up to the lead guide and it was dark. It was minus 45. It was a 50 mile an hour side wind. It's pretty freaking horrendous. And we were the only team operating in that section at the time. And I was a novice. I'm a novice to the mountains of this altitude. So I went up to this lead guide and he was feeling the pressure. And I said to him, are you, are you okay? And he, he couldn't really answer back. And I could see that he was losing his life at this point. Um, so I needed to make a decision uh, because I had a, a unit to connect the first live call from the summit. And I could see all the climbers reaching the summit of Everest in the darkness with their head torches. Um, so I was very, very close and I felt great. I felt awesome. Um, but these guys were dying around me. So we made the decision to, to stop the expedition at that point. Um, we carried him down on his, you know, with arm around his shoulders and got him down to 8,000. And over three days, we made our way back to base camp and back to the villages where his family are. And that's the side you don't usually see. Um, and I was really worried about Everest at that point, about how the young people would think about that decision. But they, they learned more about me turning back nearing the summit than they would have done about me waving a flag at the summit. Uh, there was a real life lesson for myself and for those 10,000 young children. And it became an incredible, 
incredible success. And I didn't understand the knock-on effect of the expedition until I started to then do Skype calls back at home as a debrief with all these young people. But the schools were, they had press involved in their own particular, like Japan or Thailand or whatever. They had press involved. They were bringing in chefs to cook expedition food. They were looking at Mount Everest. They were looking at the importance of the environment. And it, it was incredible knock-on effect just from my, my small journey on this mountain. Um, and I saw the complete relevance, the importance of modern day exploration at that point. You know, it's not to be scuppered. People can go and do adventure. And I encourage them to pick the right teams and do adventure. But there's a true difference between adventurers and explorers because explorers dedicate their life to, to the importance of the planet. I think that's my personal opinion. Awesome. So do you have a plan to go back to Everest and try to summit? We tried in 2019. Um, again, I did a, well, get this. I did it in, again in 2019, but my first expedition way back in 2004, where I, oh, 2006, I led a team across the Northwest Passage in the Canadian High Arctic. I linked with 18 young, 18, 18 young people from my old school in Coventry in England um, and then on 2019 on Everest we'd increase that outreach to 1.2 million young people worldwide amazing so it, absolutely and somebody who runs a podcast you understand the, the amount of you know outreach that's remarkable uh, unfortunately the expedition didn't go as planned but you know the success is measured in different ways would I go back again I have something else to do in the meantime. It's always in my mind, not as in ticking it off and getting it done. Because I think if you have that attitude, then you're just laying yourself down for, for something to go wrong and danger. If you, you are moving back into an ego push there. If I have a reason to go back, then I will. If not, then what's the point in me summiting? You know, Neil Armstrong basically landed on the moon and took the pressure off every other explorer since to achieve the greatest thing possible. <laughs> so we don't have to do that. Thank you, Neil. It's the, the person who lands on Mars, they will feel the next bit of pressure. But we're all okay. We don't have to achieve anything. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, so now let's talk about this uh, focus of yours on conservation and education. So back in 2004, you started with the kids in Coventry and then now you're on a big mission, it seems to kind of like keep educating more and more kids all the time. So how did that kind of evolve? How did you kind of like work out for yourself? This is what you would like to do because it seems to be something that drives you right now. Have you ever given a talk in a school? No, not really, no. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. If, if anybody has been into a school and given a talk on what they do for a living, it's the funniest and most inspiring thing that I've done. Maybe it won't happen with other people, but for me, when I first gave talks in schools, I thought, this is fantastic. Because the children would ask, questions that adults wouldn't ask they see things very differently um, and it was just great the way I developed my talks and I love giving talks in schools um, and when I started to do these expeditions we were doing little links via satellite phones and speakers in schools it wasn't the technology wasn't really there back then <laughs> it makes me feel old um, but then I thought well how can we really advance this um, and by linking with Skype, Microsoft, Lonely Planet Kids, universities like Warwick University, they wanted to really support, they wanted to enhance their brands through my exploration um, and show their brands in a very unique way. So it kind of worked really, really well. And it also helped with sponsorship as well, because you're doing it for a, a great visual reason, you know. Um, so I... I tried to 
every expedition that I've done since uh, 2011, which was the South Pole, has been an advancement from the last one. So an advancement on the database of young people around the world and what we, can we do next, what's exciting for me and for them. So it's like doing a movie and trying to improve it each time. Yeah. You know, um, and, it, and an enjoyment. At the end of the day, if I'm not enjoying this, then I won't have them. It's so freaking hard getting the funding, the logistics together and everything else that you just fall at the first hurdle if you're not inspired yourself and you're enjoying it. So to, to have that persistence back in the UK before you've even stepped foot on ice, it, you need that sort of, you know, inner grain of, you know, you want to do this and I've got to have fun doing it. And, and really the education side gives me fun. You know, I enjoy, I enjoy that side of it. Like I, I just tell you, this has popped into my head. I gave a talk a few years back and this really shows my range of, of speaking engagements. I gave a talk to a company in London and, and I could see the Thames outside and Tower Bridge and everything. I mean, it, you couldn't get more London than where I was. Um, and there was about, say, about 150 of these business executives in this room having their annual dinner. And I was the guest speaker. And I gave that talk during the day about business strategy and leadership and team approach and persistence and blah, 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 resilience, all the words they love. Um, and then I drove home and that evening I gave a talk to a beaver group, which is like a scout group, a cub group of like five year olds. And I was, <laughs> I was doing polar bear impressions <laughs> and penguin impressions. And I just smiled on the way home thinking I'm actually quite diverse at this. I'm quite yeah. proud. <laughs> you know, I'm glad I didn't get them mixed up by the way. That would have yeah. been a bit weird. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that the London execs are going to handle that too well. So, so where did you kind of like, um, kind of like discover that you really had this, other passion beyond educating kids about conservation like climate change because i think this is going to be a good lead into your next expedition which has a big focus on this yeah well i i started to um well i was i was asked to join the explorers club um so i'm, I'm a fellow of the royal geographical society um i enjoy going to lectures and things like that but I was asked by a Norwegian a lady called Sonova, who was the chair of the um, Norwegian chapter, whether I'd join the Norwegian chapter. I was like, wow, that's incredible. So I actually joined that. Then they asked me to join the, they asked me to chair the Great, uh, the great Britain Island chapter. Um, so there I was linked with all these great explorers and putting these events on all for free, but, you know, because it's what I love doing. So it's a different area for me. I wasn't, just focusing on expeditions i was focusing on supporting people with that, their own expeditions and I, I nearly every week i'm trying to help people out with with uh, understanding how they can put an expedition together and working with so many people and seeing the disruption in the environment and how people's lives are changed in the inuit communities and nepalese communities etc I started to really look at the environment and I don't know whether it's because I got older as well. I started to appreciate walking with my dogs in the, the fields that I live in, in England, but I, I felt this real connection and I understood the position that I was in. Somebody who's done many different expeditions and then is sort of supporting other exploration and encouraging modern day exploration as well. I, I felt a responsibility. You can't walk, I can't walk away from this. It's, it's, it's a crime if I, if I ignore this. But the way I operate and the people who work with me closely, they know that I'm kind of not a bullshitter. I'm kind of, excuse my language, by the way, but you know, it's, it's sometimes you have to say these words to enhance what you're saying. But I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not one of those guys. If I get into something, I'll do it. I'll do it properly as best as I can. And I think when I step into the environment world to talk about that, I need to be truthful to myself and to others. As an example, I'm not a scientist. So I don't understand the science of it enough to talk about it in, in a conference. I can talk about it in layman's terms as most people can, 
But if I'm questions on the technical side, then I don't want to fall over, you know? Yeah. So I bring in climate scientists to work with me. And I, 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 I'm open about that. When we did an expedition in 2016 to the North Pole, another expedition, I filmed the whole thing. And um, one of the guys on the trip was saying, oh, let's talk about climate change and how the ice... I went, well, we don't know about it. We, we're, the, we're the explorers. We're the filmmakers. We will get climate scientists to talk about what we see. And that's the approach that I've had over the years. And because I deal with education, I felt a real, a real responsibility to, um, to make this part of my future sort of makeup, if you like. Awesome. So now let's talk about this new expedition, the Solo 100. So what inspired you and what's the mission here? It's all based in Vegas. No, it's not. I'm joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, snow, no snow in Vegas. So. <laughs> no. Maybe afterwards when we come back, we'll need to do something. So um, you, I'll invite you. Don't worry. <laughs> um, no, it's what it is. Is um, I, I think it's a combination of everything I've done over the years, from leaving school to going in military to understanding how you deal. As I've said, a recap of everything I've said today of dealing with stuff if, with stressful situations without uh, emotion working with incredible teams enhancing exploration looking at the environment and stretching myself uh, physically and mentally um, and my love of the Arctic so I've combined that all into this one expedition which is a solo journey over 100 days um, it was based on having 100 voices. So young people around the world talking about the environment, how it affects them in their own area. So climate change is global, action is local. That's a better way of putting it. Um, and people live in different, different areas around the planet, you know, in hot areas, cold, cities, villages, whatever it might be. So I wanted that young person to tell their human story who they are, where they're from, their issues they face, the action they have. Very simple. To each day dedicate to a young person of the expedition. So I would come on day one, day 50, day 25 and say, it's Mark here on the satellite phone. It's cold. <laughs> you know, I'm still on the exit. <laughs> you know, um, and here is David from... Uh, Africa, who's going to talk about his situation. Here is Alison from, you know, um, Sweden. And, and just to give a hundred voices to, as the expedition is a platform and the hundred voices is what will be echoed from it. Um, so that was the idea. Um, and it, I didn't, I honestly will say that I didn't know, I didn't go into it thinking it would be a world record attempt, but Guinness World Records have been working with me and a few other guys over the last few years. And they said, well, what's the longest time somebody has been alone? I didn't really know. I still don't know, actually. I think it's about 70 odd days unsupported, unaided. Um, so I'm going to do 100 days. So it'll be a record, which would be great for kids, any organizations that attach with me as well. Um, but the most important thing about all of this is not just the education or the physical side to the expedition but it's the documentary, which might sound strange, but I'm reaching a lot of young people through the education, other people with the physical side, but to get a documentary out and make it as big as I can, it will reach everybody. Anybody who's got a TV, Netflix, can watch this next expedition, whether it's on Netflix or Amazon Prime, we haven't got a, a distributor yet, but we've got two gate production companies, one is Diamond Docks, who did Icarus before the flood with DiCaprio, eight days a week with um, Ron Howard and people like that. So award-winning documentary filmmakers, uh, producers. And they've joined forces with Hardison and Baker, which is Tom Hardy's production company in the UK. Uh, and we met Tom um, through an event, and he did the original voiceover for the sizzler that we did. 
and he's going to attach his name to this as well as the voiceover, which is fantastic. So already we've got two great production companies. We've got a brilliant uh, filmmakers called uh, Dust Off Films who are just remarkable in what they do, and they tell human stories. And the whole point of Solo 100 documentary is the human story. It's about focus, the light focusing on me, the weaknesses, the strengths, the problems, the issues, the glory, the pain, whatever it might be, will be fed into this one expedition. Um, and I want it so people will not only understand myself and what a guy from Coventry whose dad went worked in factories all his life, his mom, you know, both passed away now, his mom worked in universities as a secretary, how that family basis and where I should have gone into factories became an explorer. Um, to understand that side, but also the environmental side as well, the, the issues that we face. And really, when I started to write this expedition to begin with, because you do it as a business plan, you, you get the cre creativity, but then you need to structure it like a business. The strap line for the original idea was the insignificance of man. All I could see in my head was this white, this black figure of myself as a like an ant going across this beautiful vast enormous void of the arctic almost you've got this drone above you and you've got the two sledges and this figure moving slowly through this white void of this planet and really how insignificant human beings are compared to the longevity of this planet that we live on and i wanted to bring that across to say look you know this planet's only going to give us a little bit more time yeah. and then we've had it, you know, we've, we've, it's given all the hints out it can. Um, and I didn't want to preach either. I didn't want to sort of stand there and wag my fingers at people. I wanted to show them so they could make their own minds up. And that's what this expedition is all about. It's a showcase of my work and the planet itself. So the hundred days, so where do you start and where do you kind of finish? I'm not going to release that at the okay. moment. If you look on, if you look at the website, and I say that openly, and I want people to understand, it's not about, um, you know, it's, it's not. It is very, very special, but it's about just keeping the cards close to my chest a little bit because it is an extraordinary journey, um, and there's also there's a film attached to it, so I've got to be very careful in that sense. Yeah, but also. Um, we're still trying to build the logistics on it because we're not allowed into certain areas. Originally, it was going to be flying into Russia, training with the Russian paratroopers, parachuting into the North Pole and heading south towards Canada. Well, something's happened that I can't go into Russia nowadays, which is, yeah. which is part of the story. You know, politically, we can't do a lot what we want to do. We can't do what we want to do environmentally it's it's now happening that the logistics that are built for plan b uh the environment is scuppering it a little bit so um that's that's the incredible side but it will happen in march of next year um, so what, can i tell you how, how i feel about it sure go for it i'm absolutely i'll keep it clean but i'm in fear of this expedition and i think you should be in fear if i was complacent at this point then my heart isn't in it for the right reasons and i wouldn't have i wouldn't be able to achieve what i'm trying to set out to do but the actual i, I every day when i wake up every night i go to bed i see myself on that plane uh, heading towards the, the drop zone and um yeah it puts fear into me so so that's an interesting point. So two points. One, a lot of people assume that someone like yourself is kind of like reckless, like an adrenaline junkie. Not me, I'm just like saying. So what would you say to them? Oh, uh, my, my joints don't allow me to be an <laughs> junkie. The amount, no, um, no, I, I'm, I've never been like that at all. Um, this is a very calculated, uh, everything in my life is calculated. The risk is calculated. 
uh, the training is 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 the ma- the the approach and training is the majority of the success of what I'm about to do. Uh, everything is in preparation. The greatest um, slogan I think that you can use is a scouting one called "Be prepared." Yeah, this it is. It's you know it's all in the preparation. Um, yeah, there's no way. <laughs> yeah, there's no way I'm an adrenaline. <laughs> I can't even say it. You know, um, no, no. I mean, when you get to a certain age, like you're 55 years old, and a kid standing on got a skateboard in the road. I'd advise everybody who's middle aged not to step on that skateboard because <laughs> it's going to end wrong. In your head, you're going to be able to do all the three sixties in the world, but the reality is you won't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so the next lead in is, well, how do you deal with the fear? Because like, as you said, you know, you're putting, you're putting yourself in some very challenging kind of like situations and then the normal it's normal to be afraid it's not like a bad thing it's just normal but you have to kind of work your way through that so how do you do that um i think uh, i said before that you need to know what you're getting into so i know the dangers i'm heading into i I've, I've gone through the journey a million times in my head already and 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 i don't know the full journey yet um so it's understanding that point understanding yourself and i think over the years as you get i mean this podcast is about an, an age related you know you know everybody's over a certain age or approaching you get to know yourself a little bit better you um what you can do what you can't do you get to not care about a lot of stuff you, know, you don't get bogged down with a lot of stuff when you get older and I think that's an advantage as well. So when the fear is in me, it means that I'm the, the adrenaline is settled there within me. And it's a great thing to have. You know, when I get off the plane, I won't be rushing around. I'll be, you know, bringing my sledge off slowly. I'll be looking at my equipment slowly. I'll be calculating every movement. I'll know that the first day I'll cover one mile if that. I might even just put the camp up straight away. You know, maybe day two, maybe day 10, you know, it won't all go right along this. Um, just and whenever I give talks on these sort of things, I tell people right at the start to draw parallels with their own lives. No matter what they do, draw parallels with what I say. So when I do say that during the first, you know, during the course of a week, something will I won't feel be good. I won't feel good about something. I feel weak. I'll question myself. That's normal, you know. Um, so don't worry about it. The greatest advice I was ever given was by Richard Weber, one of the best polar explorers of our modern era. Seven times coastal expedition to the geographic North Pole. I mean, wow! And then he did a return journey on that as well. It's just incredible. And I spent a bit. Of bit of time with Richard and I said how do you reach the North Pole from a coast and he said well everybody takes immersion suits to get in the water to cross the open leads people say that they couldn't get there because they couldn't get around these open leads he said you can get around these leads you can get over ice the greatest advice I can give you is to persist persist and that was what I've carried with me. No matter what you face in life, if you face it with a clear mind and a, an approach which is right, you just persist, keep pushing forward, and things do get better, 100%. Um, the, the other thing as well, again, it sounds like preaching, but the, the other thing as well is when I used to train people, I used to tell them this, during the course of a seven to 10 day period at home, if you work in an office, whatever you do, you're going to have a down day because you're a human being. You're going to have one day when nothing goes right. Your brain isn't working properly. Your body's all over the place like some teenager hasn't developed yet. You know, (laughs) and you just, it doesn't go right. But during that day, because you're in a normal environment, you've got people to go, are you okay? you know, come and have a drink or, you know, don't worry about it. And you've got people around, you've got distractions. You can put the telly on, whatever you want to do. When you're on ice and you've got nothing around, everything is more judgmental. 
So you start looking at yourself and you say, why the hell did I think I could do this? I can't do this. But it's not about that. It's just the pressure that you're putting on yourself. So the way that you get out of that is to relax, walk away from the situation. Just take a, a five minutes off from yourself, walk away and readdress how you are and then keep moving forward, keep persist, persisting what you're doing. Um, it's a really simple thing to do. So, but no, you can also, achieve great things. But as I say, you can achieve great things if you, if you set your mind, know who you are and persist. So, and you, so when you're facing these situations, you just give yourself a mental rest period and then come back to it with fresh eyes. Yeah. It doesn't always work. As in, you know, I howl at the moon a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I'm a bloke. <laughs> you know, but I do, I'm, you know, I'm just as normal as everybody else. I, I get angry and all that. But, you know, if you can try and do that, that's, I do it a lot with my work back here in normal life i i take myself out of a situation and give my time give myself a bit of time off from myself really and then go back into it awesome um yeah brilliant i think i think i think so, sorry just as a because i love art there's a thing i like to say is an art <laughs> an artist will paint a picture and he won't be looking at anything in the room apart from this picture and he'll is lay his perspective and his ideals down onto this canvas. And what he should do and what they generally do, these great artists, is they, they look at it and they think, well, I think I've finished. And they walk away and they go and do something else. And they clear their mind slightly of what they've been looking at for the last 10 hours, three days. And they focus their mind and their brain elsewhere. And then they go back with clarity. And they can see what's wrong within the painting, what needs to be done. And it's a real analogy for, for a stressful situation. If you can, take yourself away from it and come back with more clarity. No, very good advice. So now changing direction a little bit, and we'll briefly just kind of like talk about what is adventure to you because we spoke a little bit about it and then most people are assuming you have to do something extreme but you indicated something a little bit different so what is your definition of adventure i think ad adventure can be can be anything which uh, excites you uh the mind is an incredible thing so i think it's just something which takes you out of normality of life for a short period of time. And, I, and I, whenever I give answers like this, I don't just think of myself. I think of somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who's, you know, somebody who can't go and physically do stuff. How do you define adventure in that sense? Adventure is just taking yourself out of your normal situation, inspiring yourself for a short while. Um, an adventure to... You know, the scouts that I work with is spending the night in a wood or in a church or in a museum or something, you know, that just difference of a night time yeah. can really change your senses and that. Um, for me, because I've built adventure exp exploration over the last 20 years for myself, adventure to me is, is pushing my boundaries a little bit. I still like to do that. And I haven't really mentioned that too much, but it is, I think it is, there's got to be ego in there somewhere to allow you to do what I do. Um, it's measured ego to push my body and my mind. My body still works, my mind still works. Um, and while it's still working and allowing me to do what I do, then I will keep advancing, keep putting more pressure on just to see where I can go. Because I think in a few years' time, I'd have to change direction. I, the physical side of pulling heavy sledges won't be there. I won't have that in me. So I'll change my direction of how I explore and how I want to take my environmental projects. Does that make sense? No, no, it does very much so. 
So why do you think we need to add more adventure to our lives, whatever it is for you? Why do, why do you think we should? Yep. That's your choice. You don't have to. That's the choice that you have in your life. But um, I think adventure is just an act. I think what you should add to your life is the understanding of what's outside your door. That's the more important thing. I, I would always go back, if, I, if anybody was listening to this, I'm sure they are, <laughs> um, but if anybody is this and they think, what do I want to take away from this? I would love them just to take away to understand the importance of your local environment to your, to your life, how that environment has affected the development of your life and who you are. Adventure brings that in. But the adventure for me has made me understand that. I think that's more of an important issue to understand. Um, and maybe adventure, okay, to, so adventure in a different way. Um, I got asked about, um, this lady said, what do you think of the ships that go around Antarctica where, you know, people sit and drink champagne and look at the glaciers? What do you think of that? And I said, I said I, I'm all in favour of extreme posh travel. You know, I mean, go and observe the planet. Think of it. Like um, the planet is so diverse in cold and heat and jungles and cities and culture and language and colors and space, you know, clouds. It's such a beautiful museum that we have here of, of life that we should, and we do, but we don't do it properly, develop uh, ways of seeing this, observing it. Um, whether you want to get involved like I do or you want to sit back and have a champagne and watch it, just observe the planet and, and, the, and what the people who run these companies should be doing is, is then link the idea of why what they see is so important to why they exist. That's, I think the planet should be observed in the right way. Um, so adventure comes into it in, in that strain. Very good. So yeah. lastly, on this point, so what would you say to someone who has always dreamed of having an adventure? So this is someone who's made the decision they would like to have an adventure, but is too scared to take the next step. You know, they're not used to getting out of their comfort zone, something which you're very comfortable with. Well, um, I, I do this nearly every, every month. I get a couple of people, there's a guy I'm working with at the moment, uh, great guy who wants to sail around the world but doesn't know how to begin the the how to build the expedition how to get sponsors and stuff like that so i've been helping him out a little bit um, but the one thing i saw of him was he was so excited about it and he was scared about it and he was telling me i need to do more training i need to do this and that so i think that if you if somebody comes to me and says i want to go and do an expedition i'll say well what do you want to do where do you want to work what do you what 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 makes you excited do you want to be a jungle guy do you want to be a space guy what do you want to do yeah. and once you find out what you want to do then find out where you want to go you know do you want to go down the nile do you want to go to the pyramids what, what do you want to do once you've got that so you know where you want to work you know what the area you want to work in um how much time have you got that's an important question you know not everybody's got like three months to take off work <laughs> you know how much time have you got for this how qualified are you do you go with a team or do you go by yourself what i do for for my building and expedition um is i go and walk my dogs and i think that's a great journey. Solo 100. Wow. That's a great journey. And I'm inspired. I'm out on the fields at the back here and I'm inspired. My dogs are running around. I'm like so excited. And, and then I get back home and I get a big bit of white paper and I could go and get the paper now. I can show you, but big bit of white paper and in the center, I write down solo, solo 100, solo 100, I write down in the center. And then I write down the timeline, the costs, the social media, the companies I want involved, the education, the filming, the training, the time period. And I write all of that down. And like the artist, I spend like three hours like looking at it because I'm inspired. 
And like the artist that I mentioned who's inspired by his picture, I, I'd hopefully I'm not sounding like an ass saying all this, but I then walk away because I've been so engrossed in this excitement of the expedition. I walk away and I come back and I look at it with fresh eyes and I look at everything that I've put around there and I say, this can be done. And at that point, you haven't spent any money. Yeah. All you've done, you, you just worked off inspiration. The hard bit then is to try and get the investors involved, to try and get them to believe in what you're doing, believe in yourself and then what you're doing, uh, and then to piece it together. But if, you can, if you're inspired, then you, in, you will enjoy that process, even the negativity, the knockbacks. You will enjoy the process of the build-up to the expedition. And eventually you go on the expedition, which is just remarkable. And then, uh, yeah, and then you go to Vegas. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, so finishing up now before we all head off to Vegas. So <laughs> there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask each of our guests. So number one, uh, what's your definition of ageless living? Oh. Age is living. Um, knowing who you are, I suppose. Knowing the truth of yourself. And, you know, like I say, it's a skateboard, isn't it? In your mind, you're, you're 12 years old. In my, in my mind, I'm 12 years old, running around the streets, playing football. And but as soon as I step on that skateboard and fall off and twist my ankle, I know I'm 55 years old. <laughs> So it's, it's knowing who you are as a person. <laughs> okay. So what would you say to someone who is approaching or has just reached 40 and is kind of like viewing it all kind of negatively, you know, like saying to themselves, oh my God, it's like I'm over the hill or it's all downhill from here. What would you say to them now that you've reached uh, 45? Yeah, it's, you're definitely, you've, you've had it, mate. It's, you're, all, it's, you're absolutely <laughs> right. You're, no. Um, it's life life is a gift to us no matter how long we've got uh and if you live to be 80 or 90 you've lived well it's a true gift and i think that you we can't always do what we did when we were young but we can develop ourselves for, and get in the most out of life you don't have to be an explorer you just have to to try and have fun in some way and if you're not having fun change that i think that's the key thing if you're fine, you're not enjoying your life, then look at ways of changing it. Communication is good in that sense. Communicate with your family or whatever, um, but try and enjoy it. You don't have to reach the summit of Everest or the North Pole. You just have to, you just have to enjoy, try and enjoy, embrace life, the, the gift that's been given to you. Brilliant. So what's your definition, or not necessarily a definition, but for you, what is living a legend life or your best life for you personally? Um, a lot of people say that when they're on the deathbed and they look back on their life, they want to have think of all the experiences that they've had and they've had a full, full life. I, I want to do that every year. So I, I was inspired by Rand Fine's book, uh, I've mentioned it before, living dangerously, because it wasn't about him. It was, it was about what he did. He packed his life full of stuff each year. He went on from one thing to the another, and he appreciated things. Anybody negative in his life, he pushed out, and he focused on what was important for him and the, his family and the people around him. And I think that's how I live my life. I try and, you know, as you get older, I think you get like that anyway. But um, you know, this, yeah, that's, that's good. That's how I do it. Brilliant. So what three life lessons you've learned in your life that you think would be of value to other people? Um, I, t I teach four things to children. Um, going back to the, the death zone on Mount Everest, I've got about, seven and a half minutes to inspire 10,000 kids worldwide, <laughs> you know, and they're all from different cultures. So what do I say? Well, I say four things and I'll focus on one of them. I'll just say the four things. Um, one of them is to have fun with your life. Yeah. Which I struggle with a lot um, because I work and focus too much on what I'm doing. Uh, another one is to appreciate yourself 
and we've touched on that. That'd be the first thing, actually, to appreciate yourself. Um, and the second one would be to impre- appreciate the environment, as we touched on as well. So we've spoken about all three of those. The fourth one, which I haven't said anything about, is to look at life differently. Um, people look life straight. I look life slightly to the side of that, meaning that I, I, I'm, I am serious when I need to be, but I don't take life too seriously, you know, and I appreciate the little things. I'm always mentioning my dogs and where I live, my country and, you know, um, I appreciate it's just thinking about life slightly differently and having respect for others and yourself. You can have a full life on that. The last school I ever talked to in um, down south in near London the other day, the last thing I said to them was, the biggest thing you can learn at school is to be a decent human being. And all the teachers were nodding because you you can't be academically great all the time, you know, yep. um, and you can't be the best at what you do. I was never the best soldier or firefighter. I'm not the best explorer. Um, but if you can be a, a decent human being, then that will get you a long way in life. I think that's the biggest thing you can achieve. Brilliant. Mark, thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking to you. I've certainly enjoyed the conversation. I'm sure others will as well. So for anyone interested in learning a little bit more about yourself and then also your new expedition, Solo 100, how can they find you online? So I've got two websites. One's markwoodexplorer.com and you can find out about all my expeditions and, uh, or, you know, you can buy my books off there, etc. cetera. Um, and then the other one is uh, expeditionsolo100.com, which is showcasing uh, the expedition as much as I can uh, for March of 2023. Brilliant. Mark, once again, thank you so much. Okay, buddy, it's lovely. It's been like stress debrief. Now, I'm going to go and book our tickets for Vegas, okay? <laughs> Very good. <laughs>